Hello and welcome to the first of two lectures on chapter 18. The second lecture will be on the art, music, and literature of this period. This one will provide the historical, political context which set, set the stage for the momentous cultural changes that followed, not only in art, but politically, economically, and social. We will dwell on these aspects longer than we have in previous lectures because in order to fully appreciate the changes that followed, we need to grasp some of the fundamental reasons why the world has changed so drastically subsequent to these events. As we proceed through these slides, what I would like from you to keep in mind is that the objective here is not for you to remember just dates, times, and people. It's to be able to grasp conceptually what sets this time period apart. And by the way, the painting you see on the screen is called The Death of Marat. Jean-Paul Marat was one of the leading voices of the most radical phase of the French Revolution. Unfortunately for him, he made a lot of enemies, and one of those who objected to his agenda decided it was time to silence him. She, a woman by the name of Charlotte Corday, stabbed him multiple times while he was taking a medicinal bath. His death is depicted here by the greatest French painter of the time, Jacques-Louis David. Our approach to this period will be to borrow a phrase used by many, many historians, and that phrase is simply, the dual revolutions. The man most famous for approaching these historical events in this manner was a British historian named Eric Hobsbawm, and his intent was to demonstrate how the changes in politics and in the manner in which products were produced had the effect of undermining centuries-old traditions and patterns of social norms. These result, the results of these changes have been so dramatic that subsequent historians refer to the period of the dual revolutions as the most important event in human history since the rise of cities. That characterization is not, of course, accepted by everyone. However, by the end of this short PowerPoint, I hope you will get a glimpse of why his approach has been so widely used and referenced. It's important to note, though, that both these revolutions, the political and the industrial, are still playing out and still changing our lives. So, what have been some of the results produced by these processes? Let us take a simple before and after approach. First, before 1750, and for many years after, over 80% of Europe's population lived rurally. Today, fewer than 30% do. And in the United States, it's less than 20%. Regarding literacy, 250 years ago, 90% of the population was illiterate. Today, over 80% of the people in the West are literate. Life expectancy used to be less than 30. Now it's 66, and in many countries it's substantially higher. And not only did the average person not live very long, most enjoyed no rights as we think of rights today. They were subjects of a king or a count or an aristocrat. And for many centuries, the Catholic Church had its own courts and had jurisdiction over civil affairs. They were not, in any sense of the word, citizens as we are today. And overall, life was for most, in the famous phrase of the English political philosopher Thomas Hobbes, solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. That phrase, admittedly, is perhaps a bit too harsh, but, in any case, life was not a bowl of cherries. While today modern developed countries produce virtually unlimited amounts of goods and food, so there's at least the potential for most citizens to live long and to enjoy a decent quality of life, although even in the richest, like the United States, great inequities persist, and much of that potential is not realized because those in power and the big 
Campaign donors who fund the elections of those in power choose not to make health and food and shelter insecurity a priority. The next slide shows three of the political revolutions that occurred during this time. The American, the French, and the Haitian. We will discuss those later in this lecture. What I will point out here is that it was the French Revolution that was the watershed event in modern political history. And we will look into why when we get to it. So, on to the Industrial Revolution. What you see here is a painting by a man named Philip James de Lutherburg. He painted it in 1801 and it depicts the Bedlam Furnaces northwest of Birmingham, England. In its vividly contrasting colors and forms, it hauntingly symbolizes some of the darkest aspects of the Industrial Revolution and many history books use it as a pictorial reference when discussing this era. It's also important to note that even a few decades before, a factory designed to process iron would not be deemed appropriate subject matter for art. By 1801, it was. So, how do we define the term Industrial Revolution? This definition is taken directly from the text. The substitution of machines for manual labor, the replacement of animal and human power with new sources of energy such as water and steam, the introduction of new and large amounts of raw materials, iron ore and coal. In short, it's going from these hand tools you see on the left to machines like the water frame on the right. The picture on the right is a picture of Richard Arkwright's revolutionary device for spinning thread in the late 18th century. Spinning thread may not sound all that revolutionary or exciting today because nowadays it's just one of many things we take for granted. But because cotton back then was probably as important as petroleum is to us today, his invention was greeted with great enthusiasm and it made him extremely wealthy. The Industrial Revolution also meant going from animal-generated power to water, steam, and eventually coal-generated power. And, of course, as time rolled on, that list included electric, petroleum, and atomically generated power. So, how did the Industrial Revolution and its counterpart in politics change the course of Western civilization and eventually the world? Here are just some of the ways, and again, these are many of the things we take for granted today. The ability to produce almost unlimited amounts of goods and food. Like I mentioned before, this doesn't mean food and goods are distribu distributed equitably by any stretch of the imagination. But in many countries, especially our own, we have the ability to produce a surplus of many foodstuffs. Ironically, a substantial amount of federal money goes to farmers to stop them from growing crop, crops, to keep prices up, and farmers from going bankrupt because the resulting lower prices would make farming unprofitable. This surplus of food allowed for the massive growth of cities. Never before has a planet witnessed congregations of human beings like we see today in places like New York, Tokyo, Shanghai, or Mexico City. And it is our cities which are the centers of culture, education, industry, finance, entertainment, and so much more. For thousands of years, wealth and status were predicated on land. And although land is, by any account, still important, what matters most now is what we call capital. And capital covers almost anything. Land, goods, machines, technology, resources, gold, whatever. Whatever generates money. And along with money comes status, wealth, and power. 
which leads us to the next bullet point, power structures. With the growth of population, industries, differing economic classes of people, and overall wealth comes the need to design different forms of government. Whereas virtually all prior governments were hierarchical, concentrated, and centralized, currently political institutions, at least most in the West, have to respond to the needs of much larger populations and to the demands of societies that are diverse and dynamic, not uniform and static. This again doesn't mean all governments do an adequate job of addressing the needs of their citizens and the growth of Republican, Democratic, and parliamentary forms of government is not without its critics. But we take it for granted and many of us can't imagine living under any other form of government. The growth of the middle class and the working class, although the working class is more or less debuted during what is considered the second industrial revolution. However, prior to this point in history, much of society consisted of those who fought, those who prayed, and those who labored, the so-called three estates. There were variations on this model, of course, and the so-called merchant class had been growing since the Middle Ages, but for the only overwhelming majority, the idea of social mobility or moving up in life was never a possibility. You were born into a role and you stayed in that role for life. Schools. Childhood was, over time, completely transformed. This transformation took a great deal of time, but today it's mandatory that kids go to school. 300 years ago, as soon as one was able, youngsters took their place as just another member of the productive social unit that was their family, working alongside a parent and doing what was ever necessary to keep what little food they had on the table. With the advent of new forms of technology came the need for literacy, and slowly children were moved from the farm to the factory and to the classroom. So too came new economic theories, analyzing, rationalizing, and sometimes criticizing these new methods of production and distribution. Indeed, higher education, scientific investigation, and theorizing about rapidly expanding catalog of subjects commenced at this time, and we will briefly, briefly discuss these events further in a little bit. And then there was the backlash, the reaction. Many didn't be benefit from these new social changes, and many expressed their feelings in art, literature, political pamphlets, and even sometimes at the ballot box. To drive home just how drastically these events change society, I want you to look at two graphs. The first one is from the International Monetary Fund, and it shows world domestic product for the previous 2,000 years. As you can see, an absolutely astronomical change in production occurred around 1800, right where the arrows is. The next, which is even more consequential in my opinion, shows an equal dramatic, equally dramatic change in human population. The implications and consequences of this massive increase in population are too numerous to even begin to address. And these graphs clearly illustrate the importance of the revolutions we are discussing.